Hello and welcome to our session as part of the State of Data 2020. I'm absolutely delighted this afternoon to be discussing the exams fiasco of summer 2020 together with uh, Janelle White, a student at KCL who is a postgrad in chemistry and has recent experience of being a student and what that means and how your results can affect your future. To Curtis, who took up the legal case and challenge uh, supported by Foxglove, the um, social justice and tech nonprofit, and I'm delighted that Martha Dark from Foxglove is here with us today. And Curtis is going to start us off by telling us a bit about uh, what the current situation is, what the background is, and where the case began. Hello. So um, I started looking at this actually the week before Results Day. Um, on Friday before Results Day happened, uh, a news story was published in the Guardian and the Times Educational Supplement talking about um, the potential what Ofqual's algorithm was going to look like basically, what they were doing, how they were designing this system which was designed to predict people's grades. Um, I took a look at that and thought that doesn't sound fair because they had at this point been talking about this whole thing with um, class sizes larger than 15 being evaluated solely on an algorithm whereas class sizes uh, with a class size smaller than 15 would be evaluated based on varying extents of teacher judgment up to class sizes smaller than five which had complete teacher judgment. Um, and more importantly than that, arguably, I took a look at that and thought that doesn't sound quite legal um, because there are all sorts of various different restrictions which are placed uh, in data protection law to ensure that people uh, have rights over automated processing of the data and automated considerations which have legal or similarly significant effects on them. Um, so I thought that, that, that doesn't sound like something which the government wants to be doing really <laughs> um, and started reaching out to uh, a lawyer. Um, or, uh, I started looking for lawyers, I started reaching out to one in particular um, called Ravi, who was absolutely wonderful and who forwarded me on to Fox Club. <laughs> and uh, we had discussions from there and, and, and started looking at taking the case forward. On the day before results day, we sent off call a, a letter saying, you know, we're not very pleased with how this looks, please confirm to us the details of this. And then obviously on results day, we, we saw things turned out exactly the way we, if we'd feared they would, um, which really wasn't great for anybody involved. And what was, what was sort of the immediate outcomes for people that didn't follow the story in the news? What, what happened? So across the country, you know, hundreds of thousands of students were affected in some way or another. There were people who were being downgraded uh, from their teacher predicted grades, they're what they call centre assess grades. Um, so they're not the UCAS predicted grades, this is important to note. There is a difference between what was predicted on UCAS and what was uh, done as a centre assess grade. The centre assess grades, which were the ones which were uh, supposed to be what the teacher's best assessment of what you were going to get were, were required to be signed off by the head of centre as being accurate and in the best interests of the student. They had all sorts of different considerations in place. Um, and those grades were then being adjusted further by this algorithm. So even on top of grades which teachers had already certified to be as accurate as possible and in the best interests of students, the government then decided we're going to adjust those in many cases down from where they were predicted to be, um, which as I'm sure you can imagine, you know, if you're a student sitting in uh, an exam hall across the country who's just got, gone to pick up their results paper and you're seeing that your grade has been knocked down by what is effectively a computer sitting somewhere in Whitehall with no evidence, no understanding of you as a person, no idea of the work you've put in, that's incredibly demoralizing. And if you're a teacher who's sitting there giving those slips out in exam halls, who's effectively just been told by the government, you're not doing your job properly, you're not able to actually tell what these students uh, are capable of, that's arguably even worse. You know, you're being told effectively by your employer, no, you're not doing this right. So there was this huge, huge outcry over it, quite rightly. And, you know, our, our petition online ended up going over 250,000 people going and signing on because this hit a nerve with so many people looking at what was effectively a levelling down agenda in place of a levelling up agenda that the government claims to have. And, and so many people were upset as well because, um, in effect, as you said, they weren't treated as individuals. So... This year, of course, it was a terribly difficult position to be in because nobody had sat the actual exams. So there wasn't the comparison uh, across the country of who'd got which grades from their papers. But instead, in addition to those centre assessed grades, 
teachers had also been asked to rank students, hadn't they, and, and put them in order um, for each of their, for their centres, what, what effectively a, an educational setting that had submitted those students. So those rankings had, had put in, uh, say in 100 students, number one to 100, where uh, the, the, the teachers thought the spread of results would be. Now, Martha, um, from, from Foxglove's uh, research and your understanding of how the algorithm then worked, what happened to those rankings and how did individuals get compared across the cohort, across all of the entries? So many of, so Foxglove started working on this case with Curtis back in early August. And one of the problems that we saw early on was that the A-level algorithm graded the school's hist historic merit rather than the individual merit of the student, which hugely disadvantaged bright pupils in underperforming schools. And I think we have government and all sorts, and every government body or department has to be incredibly careful when using predictive modeling to make decisions about the futures of young people. And as Curtis said at the beginning, we saw 40% of the pupils that had their grades graded uh, by algorithm downgraded by at least one grade. Um, and so Foxglove heard from hundreds of, and Curtis did as well, heard from hundreds of pupils whose futures were sort of thrown into limbo because they'd missed their place at university by one grade because they hadn't got the grades that they were predicted or, or, or expecting. Um, and also, as Curtis said, we saw, um, we saw students ranked and we saw um, teacher assessed grades completely, you know, ignored in some circumstances. And I think one thing that was very key and important is that um, the size of the school or the size of the class size of a pupil had an, had an impact on the grade that they, ha that they achieved overall. Because if the pupil was from a cohort, uh, a smaller cohort, say a school of less than, a class size of less than 15, then the teacher assessed grade had more weighting than, than a bigger, than a bigger class size and often it, the bigger class sizes are state schools um, and you know so so there was a, a discrimination issue there also. Janelle you had some questions about this earlier and we had a really interesting discussion I think how this ties into those discrimination questions and uh, using historic data. Yeah so for me so I did my I did my A-levels a very long time ago so I was the last student to do a, um, ASA2 and there was already a very big issue with discrimination there um, kind of the classism within the exam boards of um, having to pay for research having to pay for your papers back all of this kind of stuff but the I was thinking about this this morning because at least in my circumstance and though there were a lot of issues I don't want to downplay that but at least you got to sit the exam and for students from low socioeconomic backgrounds, often you use education to open doors that money can't, or you don't have the money to. So my question is, what if it, were, if it went on teacher predictive grades, that's already a little bit problematic because you have issues of race, people with um, various disabilities tend to be downgraded by their teachers, but at least it's kind of, there's an aspect of you can try and perform and try and change that. But how does that change when it becomes data and it becomes nothing to do with you and just about your area? What are the, like, are the government, like Curtis says, it just doesn't sound legal. Are they allowed to do that? And what can students do to combat that? One thing, so at Foxglove, we look at the way that algorithms are used um, in all sorts of public sector decision making, whether that's immigration or health or education. And something we see time and time again is that algorithms are biased and they do reflect the um, biases or, or, or thought processes of the people that built them. And I think the A-level fiasco shows what happens when the government sort of uses, a, comes up with a solution, which is to compute first and then ask some of these questions about the impact that it has on um, different communities across the UK later. And yeah, algorithms aren't neutral, and 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 I think we've seen that we've seen that across the country in the the um, biases and the the biases that 
the, the people building them have, have affected thousands of people's educational chances. I think it's important to note that exams as a concept are not a, a panacea. They don't solve everything in and of themselves. I mean, they are full of problems of bias and all sorts um, when they're working correctly. So I don't think it's a question necessarily of throwing the idea of anything other than exams out. That being said, obviously there are huge, huge issues with teacher predicted grades as a concept as well. There's, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no two ways about that. You do have evidence, strong evidence that in the past there has been significant bias, especially racial bias in terms of uh, UCAS predicted grades. Now, whether that's carried over for CAGs, I'm not wholly sure of because CAGs have been predicted differently. I suspect in a lot of cases it has, um, to be perfectly honest, because I can't see why that would be different. But um, I don't know that for sure. We'd have to look at statistics to, to make that decision or to make those, those kinds of inferences at a later stage. What's important to note is that something not being perfect doesn't mean that the worst possible solution should be used. And when we're using an algorithm like this, which entrenches the biases we already have even further by looking at school performance history, by looking at all of the things which were considered in the way that they were, well, there you're actually going to make things even worse than they already were. So, yeah, the situation we were in isn't ideal. Um, it's far from ideal. I think nothing really this year that's happened could be described as ideal in any circumstance. But it is also important to remember that things could have been a lot worse and things were a lot worse on results day for many, many, many people across the country. The ramifications that has had are also not equal because oftentimes if you are a more disadvantaged student, whether that be because of where you grew up, because of your race, because of any other uh, part of your personal characteristics, if you are a more disadvantaged student, you are more likely to have actually just straight away gone through clearing to have not tried to fight this in any way because you didn't have an expectation of getting better results, even if perhaps you deserved them. So you're more likely to have gone through clearing, you're more likely to have found a different university for one you wanted to go to, you're more likely to have given up and just said, you know what, no, I'm not going to university at all this year, or I'm not going to university at all. So the impacts that it's had aren't equal. The idea in the design wasn't equal, and the system we already had wasn't equal either. It's made it a whole lot worse. <laughs> Um, can I ask a follow-up question? Go ahead. So what I'm interested in is what does that mean for students now? Because as you said, um, not every student is in the position to combat this. So I know, and again, things were different um, for me. But for example, one of the big issues we had with the system is that you'd have to pay a lot of money mm -hmm. to appeal your grades. And I think that is something that still stands. So um, people would often appeal their grades, but decisions are made on results day. So universities can't just now create loads of spaces for all of the students who lost their spaces, but have now managed to appeal their grades. So moving forward, like let's say we're in the, Corona doesn't go away and we're in the same position next year. Okay, this can improve what we do next year, but what is gonna happen for the students that had to go through this and really like any help that comes after results day doesn't really do a fat lot for them because they've already lost their university place. And I had like one example, my best friend's brother, he was downgraded, he went from A, Bs to all Ds, but luckily he still got his university place. None of his friends did. And because of the ranking system, he was too scared to appeal his grades because he didn't want to make the situation, he was worried that him going up would mean that other people went down and there was a lot of, there was a lack of clarity about it. And okay, for university students who have got their university place, fine. But I'm a graduate, there are certain jobs I can't apply for, even though I have a first class master's because of my A-level results. And after a few years, they're not going to be known as the corona generation they're just going to be that one year where things went wrong and you're not going to look at that when you're looking at candidates going for a job. So what can the government do right by the students that they've wronged now? I think one of the things that we saw over the summer, um, as, well as, the, as well as the sort of fiasco about, you know, how the algorithm was used and the issues with it, there was also so much uncertainty right up until the last moment about how pupils could, could um, appeal their grades. And there's still uncertainty about that. Like we're still contacted by pupils, you know, weekly actually, 
um, and we're still contacted by young people who are feeling angry about the fact that they've missed out or that, that some people, some people, some universities were flexible and were sort of accommodating um, of some of the issues. But some pupils have had to just wait until next year or defer their start date, which is, you know, a year taken from them ultimately. Um, and I think you asked a really, or you raised an important, really important point about, you know, what the government should be doing differently if we're still in the, if we're still in a situation where students can't take their exams next year. And I think something fundamental for us um, is that the public were never consulted. The public have never been asked about this type of decision making. Um, and algorithms are used in all sorts of different parts of public life. And we've seen this summer, we, you know, there were people shouting in the street about how angry they were about the outcome. And I think this summer has been a bit of a tide change and people are angry about the fact that they've not been asked about these, these systems. So I would say that the public must be consulted in any system, including the A-level grading system, that will affect thousands of lives potentially at the same time next year, must be explained and justified to the public, including the students whose grades it will be used to assess, assess before it's used and not after. So this year, for instance, the, the 317 page paper about how the algorithm was worked, how the algorithm worked, was released on results day. And no one can, like, that's too late to do any proper scrutiny for, for the public to be able to do any proper, proper scrutiny. Um, and so, and I also think there was a serious, which kind of speaks to that point, there was a serious lack of transparency around this process. And, you know, there was very little information available to, the, to, to students about, you know, like I said, how they could appeal, how their grade had been um, calculated and that kind of thing. So I think there has to be much more transparency. And also they have to let independent auditors in, in a way to kind of make sure that, these, that they're auditing for bias and that kind of thing. Um, so I think there's a lot to do before <laughs> next year, um, but let's hope by then we're in a situation where, where young people aren't, sit, aren't having to, aren't missing out on sitting exams. Absolutely. I, I think, Martha, that's, that's really important. And Janelle, all of your points. I mean, I think also we shouldn't forget um, the consultation that, that did happen was in effect a very academic centric uh, policy based consultation and, and as, as Martha said not one that really students or the public could engage with but it, it highlights not just the problems of this year but the problems that exist every year and I think the questions you had of bias and discrimination really come out in this of why is it going to be different next year if we continue to use historic data as reference grading uh, you know, and, and the GCSE results that are referenced uh, for A-levels, you, know, you have to remember GCSE results themselves are then looking back to your key stage two results from when you're 10 and 11 at school. And from Defend Digital Me's perspective, we really want an independent assessment and audit of that because we feel the way that key stage two you know, test results at 10 and 11 are being then manipulated in effect to, to set some sort of framework of what your prediction should be at age 16, 17 for GCSEs is already a deeply flawed process. And, and the, the solution, you know, is not necessarily to how do we fix this and, and round off the edges. It may be that this effectively a, a sort of a sorting process of who is allowed to progress in comparison to their peers and who will the system hold back is effectively a broken process. And it's not just this year's algorithm and process that needs attention, but, but really the whole system. And, and we addressed the, the simple question of you know, transparency with Ofqual and asked that they produce a report template that schools could use to, to download in effect the, the different pieces of data that were being used in the decision-making process for a single student. So they would have been able to upload all of their center assessed grades, their rankings, and then the, the decision-making data that Ofqual had put into the system and been able to produce for each student an individual report. This is your result and this is how it was calculated. Now, why don't students get something like that every year? because I think it would show up actually the deep flaws in this process, which is designed to fail a third of students every year for GCSEs. 
it's, it's crazy that we have a system that no matter how clever you are, you cannot get the top grades and do better if even if all of your cohort were more clever because the system has to sort you in, in relation to your peers and one third will, will not be allowed by the system to get good grades. And, and it's effectively just a, it's producing a, a filtering system for who's allowed to progress to the next stage of education. I think that raises really fundamental questions about the design of the whole of the exam system. Um, and we're actually calling for a moratorium on the whole of the accountability system and, and some of the exams in, in uh, primary and secondary school, because I think that the, the data will be so flawed going forwards um, in the next couple of years that they're not fit for purpose. Um, but but looking looking ahead, you know, what is it? I think Curtis, you know, from a student's perspective, Janelle, from from the student's perspective, what is it you'd like to see happen next or differently um, that you think is possible? Because obviously, a lot of these questions are big picture questions. What do you think an immediate uh, next step should be? Um, and then and then Martha, we might ask you some of what are the the policy next steps might be. What's missing in the sort of process? Um, it's really interesting watching this as a university student who also went through A-levels because, as you said, the whole system is really not fit for purpose and it never really has been. And every year you watch students have the same, you know, you save up so that you can have some money aside to appeal your grades when they inevitably come in incorrectly, um, depending on what kind of institution you go to. And going to quite a good university and being around a lot of stu um, students who went to public schools, you can definitely see the difference in how you approach A-levels, predicted grades and so on. What I found really interesting is, so um, Curtis, if I'm correct, you're in year 13, yeah. so your final year of A-levels. I was in my final year of my undergrad. And both of us have quality standards for our qualifications. Both, both of us have comparable qualifications to other people who've done the same qualifications in our subjects, yet the university approach was so different to the government's approach. Every university, in fact, every individual academic had the freedom to choose the best possible way to assess their students. And because of the nature of higher education, it was just trusted that academics knew what they were doing and it was reliable. And they didn't question like, oh, you know, they're just going to give every student a first class um, and therefore a first class will mean nothing, which is what you always hear about A's and A stars at A level. And it's very different when you get to a level of education that isn't necessarily open to everybody and isn't mandatory, that they give up caring about all of this jargon, about make it like having overseen boards and all of this. So the way it worked for us is we got to opt in and out of our exams. So if you had done, so for example, Curtis, the way it would work for you is if you had done coursework that didn't necessarily count towards your course, but assessed your course and you were happy with that grade, you could choose to take that grade and that be your final grade. If, however, you thought that was unfair and you wanted to sit the final exam from home remotely, overnight, because universities sit their exams way before you sit your A-levels, Overnight, the university has developed a whole system for us to sit our exam online. If you sat the exam and during the exam, you felt like it was an unfair representation because of Corona, what else? You could opt out of the exam while you were sitting the exam. And then afterwards, if there were still issues with your grades, there were other methods of ways you could appeal it. Every university is different. This is just how it works for my department. Um, my department were amazing during Corona, I don't feel like, obviously there were certain aspects where it was detrimental, but my department did the best they could to compensate that and also allow me to finish my degree in a timely manner and not have to go back and keep doing things. I don't understand why somebody in their bedroom working remotely could create this whole system overnight, yet a whole government body that had a lot of time to think ahead of this, and it's not like it came out of nowhere, messed up this badly and and there's still no answer for what is going to happen there were so many students like my friends were like this is ridiculous blah 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 emailing the university and he's like i'm sorry we'll, we'll think of something give us like two days and there are still a level students who are like i don't have a university place i don't have grades i failed everything and i don't know what to do even though i had very good predicted grades so i think 
it is time. I can't really offer a solution, but I think it's time that we just accept that this is a flawed system and that this algorithm has just really highlighted a deep rooted problem that has been there for a very long time. And I think now it's been highlighted. I think it would be very disappointing of the government to carry on with such a broken system. So it's my two pence watching it, I guess, as an observer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's several dis different aspects to that, obviously. I, I think clearly, you know, having had everybody being given their CAGs if they were higher than the algorithmic grades isn't, is a really good step. It is, it's basically the only thing which a government could do at that stage to make things right for even a proportion of people. It hasn't made things right for everybody, inevitably, because making things right for everybody after having give them, given them false results on results day is not possible. Mm -hmm. it, it, it simply isn't. Um, it, it's almost like there's two kind of separate issues here which have joined together to become something which has been so obviously flawed and so obviously wrong but it's hit so hard in the media and it's hit so hard across the country there's this issue of examinations and uh education as a whole in, in especially in sick form but also at uh, a gcse level looking at both level two and level three education the way in which people are being taught um is correspondent to this whole thing around the exam system being the be all and end all of everything and i mean we've seen that with the, the removal of coursework from the a level uh the a level curricula um the removal of coursework from that means that obviously there's no element of um continual assessment throughout the process it's all an endpoint assessment moving to everything being an endpoint assessment has huge consequences in these sorts of cases and it's one of the reasons why wales in particular has done a little bit better because they have had coursework still they do still have an as component and they do still have coursework in some of their subjects so they have had a bit of an easier time than england has um, although not by much it's fair to say and then there's separately to that the issue of data and algorithms because we've also then seen at the same time as all of those inherent problems which were already there in the existing system exacerbating all of those problems has been the fact that the government then decided actually no we can't trust these teachers we can't trust the trained professionals we put across the country in schools to take care of our children we don't trust them instead we're going to write some sort of statistical model which uses history that is a huge problem which is not only applicable to education but it's also applicable all across all sorts of different areas of public sector work i mean foxglove have recently done a lot of work fighting a, a visa algorithm produced by the home office which was hugely discriminatory and ended up with a feedback loop effectively if you were coming from a country who had less visas in the past you were less likely to be approved for a visa which would mean your country had less visas etc 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 it's the same issue it's happening all across different areas of public sector and i imagine it's happening in the private sector as well in various different places the trouble is oftentimes people don't feel empowered enough to do anything about it because they see these one individual issue or these two individual issues and they go okay well these are these are these are really really problematic things but getting the momentum up and getting the actual ability to deal with those things is is very difficult for lots of people um and i'm acutely conscious that I am in a huge position of privilege as being a white male person in West London who went to a really good school and I was able to challenge this because of that position of privilege. There are plenty of people across the country who would have been far, far, far worse off than I could ever have imagined myself being who would never have been able to challenge this because they wouldn't have had the connections, they wouldn't have had the ability to go through all this process themselves, they might be caring for somebody who wouldn't have had the time, all sorts of different reasons. So we have a situation in which it's already difficult enough to challenge these issues, we have multiple issues coming together, and with the government now deciding as well that they want to try and curtail judicial review because it's being used by activist lawyers, they are literally just again trying to cut off people who are seeking justice. So we have a huge, huge array of issues here all coming together who are massively collectively disadvantaging people who are already in positions of disadvantage. And it's really important that we defend our rights to have judicial review done. It's really important that we defend our rights to challenge these things when they come up, because we should be looking at data critically and we should be looking at what public sector institutions are doing critically. And we should equally be saying when they do something good, we should be saying to them, well done, you've done this well. Here's how we can improve on this. Here's how can we can use this framework to build in the future. We need to be looking at what government is doing and actually evaluating it positively or negatively all the time. Listen, absolutely, Curtis. Thank you for all those great points and Janelle for those excellent questions.
both of you raising really important questions of what happens next and across the big picture. So Martha, from, from Foxglass perspective, you know, what would you like to see happen next and where do we go from here? Absolutely. So on the, on the A-level grading algorithm specifically, Jen, you talked about calling for a report into each student and, or, or sorry, the publication of a report into each student, how their grades were awarded and what the factors that led to that grade were. I think I'd really welcome that kind of transparency about how the grades were awarded, both from this summer and also moving forwards as we um, continue to have to think about how grades are awarded in the times of the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Um, I also think we need to take a moment, or government needs to take a moment to learn from these mistakes. So there's a review taking place by the UK Statistics Authority, and they've announced that they're looking at how the algorithm was developed. And I'm very glad that that review is happening, and government must make sure that it's now learning lessons from the failings of the abandoned systems. And we have to make sure that these systems don't, sorry, these mistakes don't happen again. Um, and like Curtis said, we're seeing these, these types of systems rolled out across the public sector. Um, and I think Curtis's judicial review demonstrates the lack of effective oversight or guidance governing algorithmic decision systems and a lack of published guidance leads to flawed software and processes and this causes this sort of harms those subjects their decisions and it wastes taxpayers money when systems like this have to be abandoned because they don't withhold legal scrutiny and I think this is also a cautionary tale for policymakers looking to use or yeah see um algorithmics alg algorithms as solutions to societal problems i think there's a lot more oversight needed um i think there needs to be a formal parliamentary process to scrutinize the use of algorithmic decision systems across public life and there needs to be a lot more public debate earlier as i said at, at perhaps you know through select committees or a oral party parliamentary groups it isn't enough to investigate and publicize the failings of something we already know has failed there needs to be democratic engagement on government algorithms and the public needs to be asked when and how algorithms are used before that the, the public needs to be asked before the algorithm is used i think um and fox love we will be pushing for far more far more democratic debate where these systems are concerned thank you very much it's been a superb uh, discussion um and you know we couldn't agree more and i think from defend digital me's perspective we think it's high time there's oversight of all data use across the education sector and actually time for a national data guardian as there is in the nhs around the use of health data and as many uh, recognize this the use of, of uh, young people's and children's data can have devastating effects from for their flourishing and the rest of their lives and the sensitivity of that use and application should not be underestimated. Really important questions for policymakers, really good questions for practice. If people watching this are still in the position of not being knowing what's happening to them and they're not getting the support they need from schools, you can also contact us at um, defenddigitalme.org and we'll do our best to, to point you in the right direction of others that can help. And thank you to Janelle for great uh, questions, superb input from, from your perspective today. To Curtis, congratulations on, on having uh, taken up the case and, and showing others there are routes for redress in these kinds of situations. And to Martha and the rest of the team at Foxglove for really uh, torch bearing, uh, leading the way on, on how these things should and could be different and the kind of society that we want to see as a result of using these technologies. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.